Splashdown! Artemis 1 has returned home. Webb has made its first deep field survey. Listen to the sound of a dust devil on Mars, and a space journalist is going to the moon. All this and more in this week's episode of Space Bites. The big story this week, of course, was the splashdown of Artemis 1. And we did a whole video all about the entire mission to the moon. But here is the summary for the final stage of the Artemis 1 mission. When we last saw our hero, the Orion capsule, it was on its way back to the moon, having completed a flyby and going out to the farthest that a human rated spacecraft has ever gone, except for the Snoopy spacecraft, I know. Anyway, Orion made another flyby of the moon, again, coming within about 130 kilometers of the moon, and it got a gravitational assist to complete its final return to fall back to the Earth. By the time it reached the Earth, it was going about 40,000 kilometers per hour. And when you think about orbital velocity, right, that's 28,000 kilometers per hour. So a lot faster. Just before it arrived at Earth, it separated from the European Space Agency's service module. And then it made a very cool maneuver. It's called an atmospheric skip. And what happens is that the capsule has an aerodynamic shape to the bottom of it. And as it came in to the Earth's atmosphere, it bounced once bled off a bunch of its velocity, and then fell back into the atmosphere a second time, then it continued through the atmosphere, slowing down bleeding off all that velocity. At a certain point, the outside surface temperatures on the capsule were about half the temperature of the surface of the sun, like twice the temperature of lava, it was very hot, then it slowed down released its parachutes and landed relatively slowly in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Baja, California. So this ends the Artemis mission, a complete success. Now NASA has the capsule in hand, they're going to be extracting all of the data drives, seeing all of the pictures, all of the images, all of the videos, all of the data that was gathered throughout the course of the mission. And this will set the stage for the Artemis 2 mission, which is expected to launch in 2024. And once again, we've done a whole much longer video on this entire mission. If you're trying to educate your friends and family about the Artemis 1 mission, and you want something that just gives a complete overview from the beginning to the end and into the future, share our other video with your friends and family. But congratulations to everyone involved. It's great to see the Orion capsule back home safe and sound. I look forward to the next mission. But more missions are going to the moon. So a couple of weeks ago, I talked about the lunar flashlight mission and a Japanese lander that were going to be heading off to the moon. That mission was delayed a couple of weeks. But also on December 11th, we saw the launch of the lunar flashlight and the Japanese Hakuto R spacecraft on a Falcon 9 rocket. The lunar flashlight built by NASA is going to be following that same orbital trajectory as the capstone mission, it's going to be making close passes over the moon's south pole. And it's going to take this special infrared flashlight, beam it into the permanently shadowed craters on the moon, and then watch the reflected light that's coming out of the craters. The goal here is to be able to map out these permanently shadowed craters, which are thought to have deposits of water ice. And of course, water ice is the key to exploration in space, you can turn ice into propellant to breathable oxygen to water to drink all kinds of uses. And so if astronauts can get their hands on water on the moon, that will mean they don't have to bring all of that water from Earth. And it's very heavy, it's very expensive, this is going to be a really valuable resource. And so hopefully, lunar flashlight will map out all of these deposits. And so the astronauts will know where to go where to dig, and how much water they have to work with. But also on board was another spacecraft. This is the Hakuto R lander. And this was a lander developed in Japan, actually privately as part of the Lunar X Prize. The Google Lunar X Prize was going to be a multi million dollar special prize for the first private company that could actually land a spacecraft on the moon. And many companies competed, and nobody was able to complete the mission within the end date of the X Prize, but the companies kept going. And one of the missions was the bear sheet lander, which failed. And one of the other ones is this Hakuto R and on board Hakuto R it actually has two rovers. 
One is a Japanese rover called the Sora Q transformable rover. And the other is called the Rashid rover by the United Arab Emirates. And so if all goes well, sometime in the next couple of months, this spacecraft will make a landing attempt and deploy these two rovers onto the surface of the moon. So more spacecraft on the moon. Soyuz had a coolant leak. Okay, this isn't so great. On Wednesday night, NASA observed that there was a stream of particles coming out of one of the Soyuz spacecraft attached to the International Space Station. And the Soyuz is how the Russian cosmonauts get to the International Space Station. And it's also their way to get back down to Earth. And as this coolant leak was noticed, two of the cosmonauts were suited up and were actually preparing to go on a spacewalk outside the International Space Station. So that was canceled. And now Roscosmos and NASA are trying to figure out what caused this leak. And more importantly, is it safe? Can the cosmonauts climb on board at the end of their mission or if there's an emergency and take this Soyuz back down to Earth? We don't know the answer. Probably but if it's deemed that it's going to be unsafe, then Roscosmos is going to need to launch another Soyuz capsule up to the station that can serve as a lifeboat to bring the cosmonauts home. And if they don't do that, there's really no way for the cosmonauts to get home from the International Space Station. And this is a bigger problem, not just because the spacecraft might not have the coolant that it needs to keep itself protected as it returns to Earth, but actually this coolant material is spraying out into space. It's like it's snowing outside the International Space Station. I mean, that's that's great for the holidays, not great to be spraying your space station with coolant. And so there are a lot of experiments that are on the outside of the International Space Station. And we don't know what the impact of this coolant is going to be. Are people gonna have to go out and clean this material off of the various experiments? So this is a big problem. So this story is developing when we're recording it right now. I'll keep you posted and let you know what happened next week. Webb's first deep field. Many of you have been asking me, when are we going to see that first deep field observation from the James Webb Space Telescope? Well, it's here and it's awesome. So what is the Hubble deep field? Actually, there was multiple deep field surveys. And the point of this was that Hubble would stare at this tiny spot in space that was thought to contain no galaxies. And yet the longer that it stared at this region, the more galaxies it found. In the longest version of this, it's called the Hubble Extreme Deep Field. The spacecraft stared at this one region of the sky for a total of 22 days. And in that it found about 10,000 galaxies, many of which had never been seen before, as well as about 800 that were the most redshifted, the most distant galaxies. And these were the targets that astronomers wanted to follow up with JWST. So one of the priorities for Webb was a follow on observation. It's called the JWST Advanced Deep Extragalactic Survey or JADES. And what JADES did was stared at roughly the same spot that Hubble did. But in the case of JWST, they used nine days of observing time. But in that much shorter period, they were able to see 100,000 galaxies, and they were able to essentially resolve the area with about 15 times deeper, more power, better resolution than the images that came from Hubble. In that, they were able to see all of those galaxies that Hubble saw, but they also saw a bunch of brand new ones that Hubble couldn't see, and some really, really interesting ones. The, the most extreme ones appear to be when the universe was only about 350 million years old. Part of the problem with Hubble is that it's orbiting around the Earth. And so if it wants to stare at one specific spot in the sky, it's blocked by the Earth by half of its observation time. And so Webb, on the other hand, was able to just stare unblinkingly at this one spot in the sky and build up all of these observations. This is really just the very beginning of this research. Just with the various versions of the field, astronomers will now be pouring over this for years to come, examining all of the different galaxies and really watching as these building blocks of the modern mature galaxies that we have around us as they were just first coming together. And of course, this is just going to be the first one you're going to see follow on versions of this observation year after year after year for 20 plus years. 
So expect us to see more galaxies deeper into the universe and really push the edge of what we understand about astronomy. Listen to a Mars dust devil. I've been waiting for this for so long. This is so great. NASA's Perseverance rover is the first spacecraft that was sent to Mars that actually had a microphone on board. And look, there have been many spacecraft that were hoped to do this, but in some cases the mission failed or the microphone was removed from the mission because it was too heavy or too expensive or whatever. But finally, there is one on Perseverance. It's called SuperCam, and because it is using electricity, they only turn it on for a few minutes every day to listen to the environment around the rover and then shut it off again. On one day recently, when they turned it on, it just happened to coincide with a time when a dust devil was flying directly overhead of the Perseverance rover, and they were able to record the entire approach of the dust devil, they were able to listen as the dust devil approached the rover, they were able to hear the particles of dust striking the surface of it, and then could hear as the dust devil moved away. Okay, let's listen to it now. According to their calculations, the dust devil was moving at about 40 kilometers per hour, which is actually very similar to the speed that dust devils move on Earth. We've actually heard many different sounds from Mars now thanks to Perseverance and SuperCam. We heard the sounds of its landing. We've heard the sounds of the wind blowing past the rover. We've heard the crunch of its wheels as they move through the sand. We've heard its machinery as it's been deploying various instruments and doing its science. But this is the first time that we've heard a dust devil. If you like the work that we do, why don't you consider joining our Patreon? And you probably hear me say this every week. But like this week, I'm serious. Um, advertising revenue across all content creators on the internet is down pretty significantly now because a lot of people are pulling back. People think there's going to be a recession. The Christmas bump of advertising revenue just never showed up. And so things are a little tight. So if you're like sitting on the fence, you're like, oh, I keep meaning to join the Patreon for Universe Today, but I just haven't gotten around to it. You would mean a lot to us if you would join the community. And of course, you get benefits. You will have all of the ads removed from the Universe Today website for life. You'll get advanced access to many of the videos we do, access to our discussion forums, as well as your name announced in upcoming videos and other special behind the scenes features. So please consider joining our Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash universe today. Pop goes the habitat. Are right, you gonna watch a video now of an inflatable habitat exploding. But don't panic. It's a test. This was a test done by Sierra Space and they're building this inflatable habitat called life that is going to eventually be flying to space and serving as a space hotel as well as other missions and objectives. And so this is a prototype of what that final space station is going to look like. And to meet NASA's requirements, they had to prove that it can handle the pressure. NASA's requirement was about 184 PSI, and they were able to pass that goal and get all the way up to 204 PSI before the module exploded. But again, this is just a prototype. It's about a third the size of what the final version is going to look like. The next version will probably be about 8.2 meters long, and they're going to do another inflation test to make sure that the bigger final version can handle the rigors of space. And then we should see this thing launch in the next couple of years. It has one third the interior volume of the International Space Station. And to think that it can fly in one launch and then be inflated and have that much interior space. I think these inflatable habitats are going to be a really effective way to have people survive in space, assuming they can handle the pressure. But for long term habitation in space, you want something a little more durable. And obviously, we've all seen 2001. We like that idea of the giant rotating space station that produces artificial gravity. But those are really complicated and expensive. There's a lot of materials that go into getting that into space and building that size of a structure. But a team of researchers are proposing another way to build a giant rotating space colony. 
and that is to use a kind of material that's already available, rubble pile asteroids. We've had two missions go to these rubble pile asteroids so far. You think about Hayabusa 2 that visited asteroid Ryugu, and then of course you had Osiris Rex visit asteroid Bennu. And in both the cases, these things look just like jumbled piles of rocks that are collected together under their mutual gravity. And so if you started to spin up one of these asteroids, they would probably just fly apart. So the idea is that you surround the rubble pile in some kind of mesh that's very strong. And then as you spin up the asteroid, it starts to take on this donut like toroidal shape, as long as the mesh can handle the forces involved, get the whole thing rotating. And now you've got this donut in space that's able to provide artificial gravity on the inside ring of it. And you could form the basis of a space colony surround the outside with solar panels. And you've got a space habitat. It's a very cool idea. Obviously, it's very science fiction, but I'm going to be interviewing one of the researchers behind this Dr. Adam Frank next week. So stay tuned for an interview where we go into this idea with a lot more detail. Everyday astronaut is going to the moon. Japanese billionaire Yusaka Mizawa has already flown to the International Space Station. And for his next adventure, he wants to take eight of his friends on a journey around the moon. And the mission is called Dear Moon. And this week, we got an announcement of all of the crew who will be flying on the mission. There are a bunch of young artists and content creators from around the world. But one that is close to my heart is Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, good friend and lucky guy who's going to be flying to the moon. Now, over a million people applied to join this mission from 249 different countries. And I guess Tim had one of the most compelling videos explaining why he should be on the mission. And I agree, Tim should definitely be on the mission. After he returns safely, then maybe I'll give it a shot. If someone wants to offer me a trip to the moon. Officially, the mission is going to be launching in 2023. Like next year. But come on. We're still waiting for that orbital test of Starship, then there's going to be other follow on tests that need to be done, then it needs to be human rated, so that it can carry astronauts out beyond the moon and back to Earth safely and land. There are a lot of steps I would, I would be surprised if Tim flies to the moon before the end of the decade, but I, I can't wait to be wrong. But congratulations, Tim on getting chosen. And please, please document every step of this journey. One quick note, though, on the development of Starship, here's a cool new test that we saw from Starship testing one of its engines. But I really love the perspective from overhead where you can see the exhaust plumes blasting out in all directions. So that's what you're going to be flying on, Tim. Still want to do it? There's one big story that I suspect you're wondering why we didn't include it this week. And that is, of course, the big fusion announcement from the National Ignition Facility. Well, we're going to do a separate video that will go into the details of this story. And you can understand why this is both incredibly meaningful and yet probably won't bring us the fusion power we're hoping anytime soon. So stay tuned for that in a couple of days. Those were all of the news stories that we had today. If you want to find out any more information, you can find them in the links below. You can also get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 55,000 people. I write every word. There are no ads and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Josh Schultz and Andrew M. Gross who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us. All right, that was all of the news that we had this week. It was a big week. We'll see you next week.